Hey guys, welcome to another video. Now hopefully everything is working okay. Now I will just need to set up my um, phone here so that I can read any messages coming in. Let's have a look. Now hopefully there's not too much of me cut off. I've had to position my camera slightly lower down because um, I've got the uh, my my webcam so you can see me although you're kind of looking up at me which I apologize for um, but the um, the arm that's holding the other camera which is pointing down here is slightly higher now so it gets in the way of any webcam that's directly in front of the camera so I apologize I am looking down towards you I'm afraid <laughs> right so let me just make sure I get my That sounds all right. Yeah, that sounds good. All right. Now the chat is a little bit smaller this today, so hopefully that won't be too detrimental. Slightly concerned about this camera. All right. So, what am I going to use today in session one of designing this game? We're going to, we're going to talk about my tools, and then we're going to talk about um, the, the the questions and the parameters that I'm going to set myself when I'm designing this game. And whenever you design something, you've got to have maybe a target audience. Um, you need to understand what you want to get out of the game, um, what resources the gamer is going to use. So I think that there's quite a bit that we're going to flesh out, okay? And Nick is in. Looks like I'm right on time. Good to see you, my friend. Yes, how does the uh, audio sound? Does it sound all right, my voice? It's not kind of distant or echoey. Got the mic there, should be all right. So, today I've got my trusty 0 0.5 pencil. Good. And um, I use this for everything. I don't use pencil, uh, lead pencils that you sharpen anymore. I use mechanical pencils, they are the best. If I'm coloring in, I'll use lead, but they're not really lead, are they? They're kind of like, they're like a crayon, if you, if you like. Um, this is, this is, my preferred tool. Use it for everything. We've got a, an A3 pad of paper here. And this um, has underneath it a grid. Um, I use that to do big maps when I do them, which isn't very often. But I also find it, it's, it helps line things up. If I want to draw a box for something, it's there. It, it looks a bit neater. I don't always use that when I'm doing brainstorming like this, but um, I'm going to do that on this occasion. I also have um, my iPad. You can see that there's, you can see the reflection of the camera ring light there. I'll try and keep it over this side. And we're going to use that for a little bit of research as we go, because um, I think it's important to be able to. Uh, tap into the internet and uh, check some facts. And I, I like to try and base my games like this in reality. And if I need to say check types of, um, say festive character or legend, then that's perfect. We can do that and we can have a look at that there. Okay, so this is gonna be, so I kind of put together like a brainstorm sheet. Sometimes it might be two A4 sheets or maybe a series of smaller sheets and they come together to create one design sheet but for this very for the purpose of this video this strikes me as being the best way of doing this so um, we're going to do a festive game and it's kind of going to we're going to it's going to be all over the place this so we're going to do lines and all sorts of different things so it's going to be festive I'm going to put that over here now what is festive I was I haven't and incidentally I haven't thought much about what this game is, what it's going to be about. There, there isn't any 
I've got, I haven't got any hidden goals. I thought that it should be sort of festive based because if that's the time of the year. I think that, that makes perfect sense to me. And um, But there's lots to unpack with what festive means for people. Now, obviously, some people don't celebrate this time of the year. I, I'm not a religious person, but I, I tie very neatly into the climate and the weather and the seasons. And for me, this time of the year is about reflection. It's about, it, there's that historical tie to bringing in your animals when it starts to get colder, you know, to start looking at nature in a different way and um, how we interact with that and how we take shelter. So, um, but there are many cultures that associate this time of the year with creatures and monsters and characters, like, for example, Father Christmas, um, St. Nicholas, you know, all of that type of um, thing. So we're going to put out a few ideas around the festive in a minute. We'll brainstorm that. But what what is it that we're also looking to do with this game? Um, it's going to be, it's a solo player game. So let's put a solo player game. Now that, as a, as a, as a, um, as a concept, uh, as a, as a word has changed. Because I find very much that the, uh, we call them solo player games, but some people call them single player games. Um, some people call them solitaire player games, solitaire games, a bit more old fashioned potentially. Solo player games I think ties in a bit with um, the uh, gaming industry a bit more. And I think for a lot of this stuff we have dragged across uh, stuff from, from computer games. And I certainly do, I certainly will. I mean, you probably, you'll be able to see that in how we do this. So, I, I like this solo player arena at the moment, and that has been growing uh, as um, as the pandemic worsened, uh, more and more solo ga player games were being produced, and now it's kind of like much more of a buoyant market. And it's, it's kind of easier, in a sense, to put together something that is solo because... Once you start adding more players, you need more pieces. You need to think about how those players interact. And so it's probably easier to create a solo player game here, although some people will disagree because maybe creating a solo player game involves other things, other narratives. You have to, in a sense, create an arena for that solo player and have kind of like random properties which introduce some kind of play replayability. We're going to look at replayability. So from the solo player game, we want replayability. I, don't, I still don't know if that is actually a word. So for replayability, we need, we need some kind of random element, don't we? So how um, random elements. So what could create a random element? Well, dice. Um, it's often a way, isn't it, of creating? Are we going to use dice? We could use tables, but you might have to roll on the tables to get, um, unless there's some kind of, unless it uses a reference system through experiencing squares through experience. So that may well be, say, for example, um, if you're moving around a board and you choose to go onto a square, that square may then trigger some kind of random event, possibly. Um, so that is important. What I don't want is a game you play once and then you don't want to play a game. Okay. So we need it to appear as if um, we've got some kind of way in which this is going to um, change, evolve. So it needs to change and evolve. All right. So replayability. Now, 
I think I'm, I want to put on. I want to put some constraints on the type of game that I'm going to create. In a sense, it's solo, but how is it going to present itself? Okay. I think for this particular game, because we want to take it from doing the design here. Moving to a um, to maybe a, a fleshed out world or concept that we can then build this game into. I'm going to then type up some stuff, do some drawing. It's going to involve drawing. Now, one of my strengths is um, map making. Okay, so there's every chance that we may have some maps in this. We may not. Again, that comes into that arena. What is the arena for this for this game? Oh dear, oh dear. <laughs> that end just completely went wild then. So what is the arena for this game? Um are we gonna have we're probably gonna have maps. So that could tie in nicely with that. It doesn't have to be a map. It doesn't have to be a map. It could be you. It could be a game where you're based in a tavern, say for example, or it could be that you don't need to phys physically show where your space is. You could just be in a group or something like that. So we'll see how that evolves. That that's an interesting side to what what we're creating here. How how does how does that how does that work? So the location. Now, I don't see any restrictions on that. My research is probably going to indicate where that is. All right. So, um, how is it going to present itself? So, we want some rules here. I like, to, I like to give myself some rules. It's up to you. You don't have to give rules. But these rules I can break. So, they aren't set in stone. They're a flexible thing. So, so rule number one. Um, it's going to be a game on one sheet of A4. So that is the game. It's presented there in front of you. You have one sheet and you can see all the elements of the game. Okay, so the elements of the game are on um are, are laid out in front of you okay so what are th so we'll discuss what those elements are going to be okay so we've got that's the first that is going to be a massive thing so the game is presented on one sheet but i want each sheet to be an episode so each sheet is an episode. So different. This is like these are the two. These are the, really the the two main ideas that I bring into this. Okay, I just hit my pencil. It's annoying. Um. So the, this is the only thing that I've really considered. Something festive. Something that is on one page because. I want to be able to like produce episodes of this so I can just kind of print off something that happens. Uh, you may be there in while they're in a cave one day or maybe they're they're in a dungeon the next. Who's it doesn't mean that there's gonna be dungeons involved. Okay, so um what we're gonna do now is let's have, just double check. So we've got solo, we want replayability. That's gonna be a massive thing. We've got um a game on one A4 sheet, which is a letter size sheet. If you if you're not aware of what those sizes mean in, in Europe, we have A3, A4. So it's going to be A4. That is key, I think. We'll have to see. And each sheet is a different episode that uses the same rules.
Okay. So we'll have a, um, and then we can just keep creating. Now that's not to say that we're not going to have. Um, okay. Well, let's put actually let's put three. Um, you will have a character. I think. Although thinking, but that that actual asking that question, a character. What does that character could that character be? A company, say. Right. So um, the character could be a company, or maybe a similar thing, a business, or maybe something like a cult. Or um, it could be a band of people. So you control something. Let's put that down there. So you control, and you'd need to, wouldn't you? Some element. This is sort of this is we're talk, we're talking about the basics here of the game. All right, so um, I quite like the idea of it being some kind of company. And by pulling out that that has that that in my mind has become a key a key word company. All right, that is now a key word. That is going to drive some of my creative decisions um, because, you know, as I think about it, control, having a character is your standard um, modus operandi, isn't it? It's, it's that is where where you you generally exist in a game as the character. Well, what if you had a company and that draws that again that that pulls upon the gaming. Do you remember I said we may be inspired by computer games here? Well, that is a possibility that we have this company, and because you, you, there's lots of games where you're where you're you're running a company management type game, and um, or a village or a settlement. Now that is another interesting thing. Um, could the company be a settlement? And then that also brings up the tower defense. Genre. That's not one that I've necessarily been drawn to over the years. I'll be honest with you. Um, where you've got, you manage a settlement and something is attacking it and you have to, uh, in, on, in some way, um, defend it, throw warriors in the way, build defences. As a game online, it's something that I've played a lot. You know, like Age of Empires, classic, where you would build your um, your, your city and you build your walls and then there'd be other settlements that come and try and take it. That actually may tie in with the maps. You know, we may well have a, a map that has your settlement on, but some other settlements as well, potentially. Or maybe there's invading force. We've done an invading force with Dark Force incursion, so we're not going to go down that lane. Right. So we've got a feel here. Solo game, one sheet, potentially controlling a company that has some time with some festive uh, element. So what we'll do now is we'll we'll look at... Um, some some uh, research here. So what, I'll show you a little bit about how I do some research. It's your standard fodder, really. So we've got um, let's just bear with me a minute. Uh, 
clear down all my all the windows here. Excellent. Right. Hey Cody. I set an alarm just for this, then got breakfast and was watching um, Deadliest Catch. Just now saw you alive. Age of Empires 3 is the best, in my opinion. France was my favourite faction, very strong. Age of Mythology was fun as well. Yeah. No, I, I, um, I can't remember. I usually pick something a bit more sort of foreign, maybe set in the Middle East or something like that, or something a bit more ancient. Right, so um, what we're going to do is we're just going to start with a very, um, very simple thing. Right, uh, festive. Festive law. That's what we're going to do here. Um, mm -hmm. What's this about? So, Cody, let me just quickly recap for you. Um, just laid out some basic principles because we're designing a designing a solo player game. Um, I want something that's replayable, has replayability. Um, I want it on one sheet, one side, so A4 or letter. Um, but I want those to be sort of like episodes, and you can maybe carry on the same character. And then we were thinking about character. Do we want a character, or do we want? a company or a business or a cult or something like that that you control and you manage through this game and so company becomes a key way and that does time with tower defense i'm not really into the old tower defense personally but um it, that may be part of it who knows and it's going to be festive so i want to look at um festive law or festive traditions. Um, now, one of the places that I'll often go to is Scandinavian uh, law. And I'm going to put that in actually, because it doesn't look like many's come up there. Although, having said that, some of the, these are just adverts. Christmas law. Let's have a look here. I want it to be kind of Christmassy to begin with. If it if it's a good system, then we will we can carry that on um, with uh, a different. We could we could probably transfer it across to just just standard non festive thing. Um, you'll get. Well, I'll I'll go into that later. Christmas um, legend. Christmas legends. Let's have a look. All right. What have we got here? Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. Right. Christmas legends. You could, this is any any site. Um, Legend of the Robin. Legend of the Christmas Spider. What is that about? Legend of the Christmas Spider. Stories about a poor widow who could not afford to buy gifts for her children, but still wanted them to have the best Christmas ever. I'm going to use one of these as inspiration and kind of just expand it out. Um, she then cleaned the house, decorated the tree, and lots of joy and happiness. After having done so, she exhausted, soon fell asleep. Um, she cleaned her house so well, it was spotless, and there were no spiders or cobwebs. Um, the oldest and wisest spider suggested they sneak out of the attic to have a look at the beautiful decorated Christmas. Right, okay. So this is, that is... 
Legend of the Thunder Oak. Legend Long ago, the forests of Northland, there lived heathens who worshipped the war god Thor. Um, to the respect, Christmas celebrates the birth of uh, fables of Christmas. There was a tree called Thunder Oak, which was Thor's altar, which received nourishment from the blood of humans and beasts. It was so dense and uncanny that no men or animals came near it, nor did any birds sit in its branches. The story took place on Christmas Eve, when it had been snowed, and the entire tree was white and damp with snow. Trees. <sighs> okay, I've got the festive thing over there, but because of the, the setup, we're gonna we're gonna have this section down here. I'm just gonna just gonna start throwing out some um, some story ideas, if you like, setting ideas. We'll put it here. Just put setting over this side. Now, um, I like this Thunder Oak concept. Thunder Oak. All right, that is Thor's altar where they sacrifice animals. Thor's priests gathered to perform winter rites under the tree, which involved human and animal sacrifice. They lit the fire and were preparing for victims to be sacrificed when Saint Winifred and his devotees appeared and stopped the white-robed priests. For the victims, it was a second life. Saint Winifred pulled out a shining golden axe and hacked the tree at its base. The priests were dumbfounded as they... Um, the priests were dumbfounded as they realised what was happening. Thus fell the mighty tree of Thor, but then something unexpected happened. There was a young fir tree just behind the thunder, which was unarmed, unharmed by the fall of the great oak. St. Winifred dropped his axe and turned to address the people. He represented the heathens, a tree which was a symbol of God, an evergreen tree pointing towards the heaven. Okay. Hmm. So, not really a huge amount to be taken from that in my mind. This huge golden axe that St. Winifred pulled out. We put golden axe. I don't know what or how these are going to be connected. We're just going to have to see what happens. Uh, the first symbolised love, kindness and sacrifice. St. Winifred advertised that the tree should be kept inside the homes. Oh, I see. All right. So this little tree, a young child of the forest, shall be your holy tree tonight. It is a tree of peace, for your homes are built of fir. It is a sign of endless life, for its leaves forever green. See how it points towards a heaven. Right, so this is the reference to the Christmas tree. The fir tree is a symbol of peace. The tree, the Christmas tree that we put into our homes... It tips points in the heaven, thus uh, declared as a, it's a little bit of a ambiguous pointing to heavens, pointing, it grows up towards the light. I guess that's the connection that they made with that one. <laughs> um, the first symbol, so I quite like the idea. All right, so fir trees as maybe a, um, as, as a product. You could have um, some kind of uh, forest where you, you grow, maybe you have a plantation where you're growing Christmas trees. And maybe what we're looking at here is an engine that is designed, an engine that simulates um, tree growth or plant growth. So we might have, so if we had, say, a series of trees, um, saplings that are, um, and then have to grow. Maybe saplings, um, they are, um, you have to sort of look after them throughout the seasons. Maybe get four seasons and, um, 
a series of a series of events you could look at weather events happen and it's how you deal with those events events um, dictates how many Christmas trees you see through or sell so kind of like a seasonal it may be that there's four could be like four turns four turns for the four seasons potentially what about a game called claw where you're where you've your misbehaving children trying to get away from Grampus. Are you looking for more a scary theme with a festive background or more uplifting? That's a good point. I don't really know at this point. Uh, I, I don't know. What I don't want to make is something that is too grisly. I think. I, I don't really... I know that some Scandinavia, some European Christmas stories have monsters and creatures... And I've used those myself in in other uh, in adventures and stories, but I kind of feel like um, for this particular game, I want it to be um, uh, you know have a universal appeal. I think um, I'm going to put universal appeal there because that is a good question, Cody. Um, the Grampus thing um, where children are being chased I don't think I'm going to have children in this to be honest I just think that that's a minefield uh, unless you're specifically tailoring it for that child market I, I find I find that a little bit sticky that area so I'm not I'm not going to go with with the children um, but this fir tree growing these fir trees that may not be terribly exciting to a lot of people but I think it's something that could be engrossing so we could be looking at, for that, we could be looking at diseases, um, weather, um, nurturing, um, the, the uh, soil. So it's like a ma it's like a management game that that growing fir trees each season. You're presented with a maybe a, a number of events. Um, and you could, in the sense, you could have different locations where you're trying to grow trees. There could be a formula as to the right combination of soil and the ground. You might start with a budget, starting budget. And you have to decide, are you going to enrich in the soil? So... How would that, in a sense, that that that's kind of like that that is that sounds quite interesting to me. But we're not we're not going to go there exactly with it for the minute. We're gonna that is one idea, and I could really kind of flesh that out a bit more. We'll, we'll just we'll we'll stick with this earlier stage still, and we'll try and we'll come up with some other stuff. So that has purely been inspired by the story of um, Legend of the Thunder Oak. Okay. It's completely the the idea is diverse compared to what the story was originally about. But if we're thinking about fir tree as a symbol of Christmas, I think that that is a a massive thing. The tree, and maybe that that could go somewhere else. We we'll put that over there under the festive bracket. Let's have another look over here. Um. The legend of the candy cane, the sage plant. Legend of the sage plant. This is this could be interesting. Again, a plant theme. The story. Oh, it's King Herod. It's a biblical. Was outraged when he heard the ancient prophecy of the birth of the guardian angel and the future king of the Jews in his country. Herod, who believed in Judaism, scared of the prediction of the Messiah's birth, went on to massacre. Right. 
I don't really like where this is going. Although, you know, it, it, I don't really want anything that's too biblical. I know that that is largely what this, a uh, lot of what people associate with this time of the year. But I'm kind of more interested in um, uh, nature-driven ideas. The Legend of the Magi. That's probably going to be another religious. Yes. All right. We will probably uh, move on from this one and look up another site. Legend of the Nutcracker. Let's have a quick look at that. The Nutcracker's ori origin comes from the Erzgebirge, Erzgebirge region of Germany. These dolls were first made in the 1700s. Due to the ample supply of wood and depleting supply of metal, Carving these intricate wooden nutcrackers became the livelihood of the people of the Ezraberg region. Today, the German nutcracker is a valued possession and collectible over all others. It takes 130 steps to create a magnificent piece of art. Mm. That's an interesting statement. One wonders as why the dolls don't have a smile on their faces. The answer is that the people incalculated their everyday hardships into the dolls they created. I think this the, the English here is not very good. Their lives were hard, the working conditions bad, and they did not get paid well. The book, The Legend of the Nut, Nutcracker and Traditions of the Ezra Berg, written by Ken Althoff, Althoff speaks of an old German folktale about how the Nutcracker came into being. The story... The story stated that there was a farmer who offered a reward to a anyone who could help him crack the walnuts that grew on his tree. Okay, cracking walnuts. All right, cracking walnuts. Can't see right, that. That that's a really bizarre thing. Uh, the the carpenter told him to. To see to saw the nut in half with a soldier while a soldier told him to shoot the nut. It was finally a puppet maker who came along with a beautiful puppet made of wood and painted in bright colours, which had strong jaws that could be used to crack the walnuts. The farmer rewarded him by giving him his own workshop, though workshop. Though this is just a folk tale, it can safely be said that the dolls are being being made for the past 250 years or so. In Germany, it is also said that the nutcrackers bring good luck and protect the house. Protection could be a theme. Protection. Right. Let's have a think about the protection idea. So these nutcrackers, right, placing nutcrackers brings protection now if there was something that needed protecting maybe the game could be about positioning an object or a possession let's say a nutcracker it could be called something like the nutcracker army Again, this is a bit like tower defense stuff, isn't it, really? And you have something in the middle, and then again something attacks, but the defense is is the position of the nutcracker. I don't think it's quite as good as the fir tree idea. Is there a creature that likes to chop down Christmas trees or eat them? Could use nutcrackers to protect from them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, this is that kind of popped into my head as well I'll be honest you know this because um, we've got the trees here already <sighs> they could be 
they could be something a, 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 like a magic item if you like they could be a magic item for the fir tree for the trees could be right move on from that one for the minute i think that's going to linger in the back of the mind all right let's have another we're going to look at um let's just do where are we going here uh scandinavian christmas because they've got some great stories over there. Store, um, stories. Uh, that's a book. Maybe we put legends. Yeah. Well, it's kind of with it as Swedish stories first. Let's go with that one. Right. Ah. Hate it when it does that. Click on an advert. Right, so uh, Lucia, um, it's an old tradition where girls dress up in white dresses and robes, and candles placed have candles placed in their hair for safety. Um, it's a Catholic tradition that one. Most countries around the world have specific shows aired on Christmas Day. We're gonna to have to look at something a bit more specific, aren't we? Tom Tem. A Swedish version of the Johnny Man Johnny Man many people know today. So they have a Father Christmas. I tell you what, I've got an even better idea here. This is often the case when I'm looking at um, for research. You know, you kind of you bounce from thing to thing. So we're going to go for pagan Christmas um, traditions. Uh, maybe, maybe have a look at this one here. Um, Vikings have their say. Saturnine, eh? Sol Invictus. This doesn't tell the whole story. An equally important influence on the festive rituals today came from parts of Europe, particularly Germanic and Nordic people. The word Yule, for example, derives from the Viking festival, festival which was held to encourage optimism and good luck during the depths of winter. So that is interesting. We'll put that, let's put that down here. Can't really see that far down. Let's put Yule here. That refers to a Viking festival. Which is 
interesting Viking festival which was held to encourage optimism and good luck all right so that's an option in a sense that could be one of our goals doesn't feel like a very good goal depths of winter according to one best known viking sagas hakon the good the 10th century king of norway deliberately used um yule celebrations to smuggle in christian faith having been raised as a christian in england hakon practiced his religion in secret because the land was alto altogether heathen and there was much idolatry um however he established in the laws that the yule celebration was to take place at the same time as in the custom with christmas in other words turning it to a solstice festival into the celebration of jesus the saga goes on to say that before that yule was celebrated on midwinter night i quite like the sound of midwinter night as a as a kind of almost like a, a name for a, a game midwinter night and that king coaxed those who were dearest to him into becoming christians um the coaxing element is a fascinating um maybe fascinating based to a mechanism in a game coaxing something into how would we manage how could we portray that in a game if you were coaxing something into joining you say for example that might be something fascinating to think about um the yule log itself is a relic of those long lost days right so we're getting the tree element again aren't we the yule log i mean uh, midwinter night yule log i've come feeling the connection between the, the this the tree management idea um it's a relic of those long lost days although today we tend to think of it as a big cakey confection to stuff into our faces in rare moments we're not gorging on mince pies and when we're not gorging on mince pies and quality treats yule logs were originally real actual logs its origins are obscure but we do know it was traditionally burnt on a fire and was sent said to bring good luck the yule log hmm interesting and possibly you have to protect a growing christmas tree from pagans or people that want to destroy it yeah hmm. maybe maybe you have to that that's an interesting idea maybe what what you have to do is you have to in some way grow the yule log through managing trees if you can ma if you can grow the trees well enough look after them so they become fine examples maybe then you use the golden axe to cut down the golden axe from the legend the legend of the thunder oak to then cut down the right tree and create the yule log maybe that is maybe that has something to do with it all right i quite that could be something we look at more that that feels there's some sort of connection here I'm still enjoying the concept of the fir trees growing, but the Yule log as a prize, as a magic, it's almost like a magical good luck charm. We'll look into the Yule log again in a minute. Mistletoe is another em, em, emblem. Em, emblematic emblematic reminder of the pre-christian traditions of the region the parasitic plant is unlike un, is an unlikely symbol of romance and christmas courtship today and it is important in winter festivals and is said to stem back to north 
to a Norse myth involving the infamous trickster god Loki. Again, we're getting connections with some of those earlier pagan gods. We had Thor for the thunder oak that revealed the fir tree. And then we've had um, the Yule log, um, which doesn't seem to have any association with God, but we may may well have. And then we've got mistletoe. It's associated with Loki. As the story goes, another god called Baldar was driven to paranoia by visions of his own death. His mother, the god goddess Frigg, who we know about, made every earthly object vow never to harm him. As a result, Baldar became known as his for his invincibility until Loki turned up and fashioned a weapon out of mistletoe, the one thing which hadn't made the vow. Baldar was killed, and Frigg's tears of woe were caught on mistletoe's branches, turning into white, pearl-like berries, symbolising her love for him. Remember... Remember that story the next time you find yourself stuck making awkward flirtations, small talk underneath a clump of mistletoe at a party. Okay. Right, so we've got mistletoe. That is a weird that is a weird story. Things everything made a vow. Can objects make vows? Hmm. I don't know whether that that plays into our stream of consciousness for this particular game at the moment. Um, and it says here, as for the most famous symbol of festive season, the Christmas tree, it's possible this is a descendant of the evergreen ornaments used by both Roman revelers during um, Saturn Saturnalia. Saturnalia? So you've got Saturn, A-L-I-A. -A. Uh, traditions of tree worship during winter solstice rites in other pagan cultures in which the evergreen representing new life in the midst of the darkest and despair right so um i like that new life in the midst of darkness and despair right I don't know whether any more there's any more on here. I'm liking how this Yule, how the tree element is um is drawing me in. Um, other celebrations of the season. Such is the significance of the winter solstice and long ominous nights of winter in general that a glittering variety of festivals have sprung up across countries and cultures. One interesting example. Uh, okay, let's get that. Uh, it's a religious... Um, uh, talking about Hanukkah, Festival of Light... Singing songs over in China. Meanwhile, right. Mm -hmm. Cultures seem opposed in many ways. Actually, share the human concerns, passions, and superstitions. Whether, right. Okay, so we'll go back, and um, I think we're going to look at. Apparently. White tailed deer do more damage to Christmas trees than any other. There you go. White tailed deer. Thank you. Put that in there. Um I think it's probably worth worth me saying as well. That I, for me, the games that I design aren't just necessarily based around fantasy. You know, I'm interested in games that simulate real things in life as well. So that definitely plays a part. That That's playing a part in my thought process here. I'm not going to just 
design something that is uh, a, a slimmed down version of Dungeon Dragon, say for some, for for example. How would how would actual gameplay look like that? That is a good question. So for this tree for this tree game, the Yule Log game, where you have to maybe protect the trees and then create this Yule Log. Um, you would maybe you would a turn would be maybe half a season, and within that season there may be some events, and you have to make some decisions about you know what you did about those, and then uh, maybe ra ra roll on a, a table or um, solve some sort of puzzle that then um, gives you maybe each tree's got a, a, a life status. Maybe the trees have a red, yellow, and a green status. I like to use those three colours in some of the games I design, as you know, in Rad Zone. Maybe trees move, shift from status. Maybe there's area effect. Maybe there's an illness. Maybe a herd of white-tailed deer come into that space. How would you then manage it? Now, you've got to think, what setting would this go into? I automatically place these things into like a medieval world. I, I rarely kind of place them in today and might place them in some kind of apocalypse potentially um but yeah you would have to manage and if certain trees died you could plant new trees you may have some money well i'm going to plant some new trees and you could maybe draw on a tree on the map uh, and each tree would have maybe a ring around it that uh, had a health status bar on it and we'd see when you get to the end would you did you have enough trees you could then try and cut one down with the golden axe and um create a uh, a yule log and if you do that then you've succeeded <laughs> so i mean as a as a concept as a game i think i feel it like it i don't think i've ever seen anything quite like it you got you've got your management games or computer games but this would be an interesting challenge to see how you could create the simulation. Anyway, it's just it's just an idea. Um, so there's the Saturn celebration. Uh, we've got um, Saturn plays a big part in this. Uh, Saturnalia, I think it's said Saturn Saturnalia. Held in, in mid-December is an ancient Rome pagan festival honouring the agricultural god Saturn. Right. So Saturn is viewed as an agricultural god. But what we want to have a look at here is um, Yule Log. Story, let's just try this. I think this may inform us of the um, Yule Log. Um, we'll do Wikipedia for this one. The Yule log, Yule clog, or Christmas block is specific, specially selected log. All right, let's just put here. Gameplay wise, maybe you have a tree farm. Yeah, well, this is what I was saying. Yeah, a six times six grid inside your, you draw trees as they grow, starting from the trunk, lower half, middle, and then top. Events could be rolled with a d6 and would affect the row of trees. I mean, yeah, I, I, that that's that's an interesting idea, um, Cody. How those trees, what they, how they look on the game, I think for me is going to be top down, so you can see your field if you like. Cause, the minute you have to get too involved with the drawing, I feel that people get a little bit resistant, to be honest. 
We'll see. That is the mechanics of that, which hasn't been fully fleshed out in my mind. So what we'll do is uh, I will... I'm going to keep doing a bit of research here. I'm going to read about the Yule Log and see whether that feeds any information into how this game might run. Because that having those trees chopped down at the end seems a bit of a... Seems fine. Okay, I managed to get five trees. That might, might be enough for people. If you're given this the parameters for the tree, you get this map, and you get some nice trees drawn on it, and you and you, you have to manage them, you know, maybe it, there's enough reward as a goal for people for them to just try and get as many trees chopped down for, for Christmas as possible that are in saleable condition, that are of a saleable standard reach a certain quality and um, maybe that could be a good enough goal so would it be a card game battlefield or map um, plus tokens well good question it would be a map I think I think we've established that already we want to try and use the map my map drawing skills try and use the skills that you've got and um, the map would maybe include things like um quality of the soil so you, i may it may be a map of color whereby you have um say uh, a map like this and in it you have waves of color and that indicates the quality of the soil some areas may be best but then other areas may be uh, less fertile. And those don't grow as quickly. So it may be that it, there's, there's colours on the side, say, and then they may be um, plus three on a very basic level, plus two, plus one. And there's seasonal growth, potentially. And you get a grade of tree that um, you can get work these trees up to a certain grade. I, I don't know, I, I don't think at this stage I'm thinking about a card game. I haven't completely ruled it out. I think that a card game involves a lot of design and a lot of printing. And I don't really want too much stuff printed out. That's kind of key. I, I, I just want it to exist on an A4. So it may be that you get um, a piece of land. So each each A4 sheet equals a piece of land. That has qualities. Which makes me think of RimWorld. So you know the game, the survival game RimWorld, where you're top down... And you, you have got your little men and you build stuff. and Well, it's all based upon the quality of the land, where you're at. And when you first pick the area, you can pick like barren areas, you can pick lush areas. And um, they each have an effect on how the game plays out and what resources you need and what you might need to buy more of. You might need to buy more um, fertilizer if you're on a barren area. And that might well affect how the tree, how you've got um uh how you manage the local deer population you know you may have to employ a hunter who who keeps the deers down so you lose less trees at the end of each um season you would roll on a die that would that you would your modifier because of the things you've done so that there's a tactical element to it affects um, that die roll, you add it to the die roll, take it from the die roll, and then you have um, you then result with so many trees you've got left over. And you go through the, you start maybe in spring, uh, and then summer, autumn, winter, and then by the time you get to winter, how you've handled those experiences will result in how many trees you're able to chop down. Let's have a look at um, the Yule log, just because that might give me a bit more inspiration here. Um, we may well need to gather, start gathering information about how fir trees are affected by things, you know. If you don't want the player to draw, how would you determine how you grow trees? 
most tree farms at least in America are uniform and in organized rows true true but their tree farms today this may well be set in a medieval period okay so where maybe they're not as regimented and they may have restricted land where they grow their trees so it, the time period is important what period because that may well affect how we do it and the without drawing the trees you could uh, arguably you could create you could have a tree right on a very basic level a tree like that kind of like there is a tree right around that tree off it you could have some tabs right that are status bars and these trees maybe that's the growth maybe there's five stages of growth and you've got to better push these trees through this growth period so they get to that fifth tier and you wouldn't have to draw the tree you could just alter like in a euro game you might you could even put like counters down on these trees as they grow there may also be um dashes around the trees that are um that indicate um, one might be disease one might be um damage um so if you if you tick these and they're damaged it, and it could affect how how they then get through that particular season so you're kind of managing each tree based upon the the effects that have happened uh, this is just obviously you know um a rough rough concept um let's have a look the yule log is a selected log burnt on a hearth as a winter tradition in regions of europe particularly the united kingdom and sub subsequently north america the origin of the folk custom is unclear like other traditions associated with yule such as the yule boar the custom may ultimately drive be driven from germanic paganism okay so this is nice all right so we are deep in medieval europe okay and we need the customary yule log that is going to bring luck and see us through the season to the next to into spring but we need a a, a a fine example of of a tree to give us this yule log and if you can get this yule log through growing these trees over this period then you you've done an awesome job um but it, it's unclear so the it's unclear where this folk custom came from which gives me a bit of leeway to sort of make it up Okay, it's unclear where this custom came from. So, similar to drop pods with the tabs, dots next to the eggs. Um, yeah, I guess so. I guess in in some respects. Yeah, but they may be more complex, like a little dial attached to the tree um with some other yeah well we'll have to see i'm gonna have a little look into how trees are affected you know we could have come up with some diseases um and you know we're not going to have modern fertilized modern uh stuff to to cure these diseases if they get it maybe they just die i don't know we're a little bit off that yet okay Let's have a look here. But I'm liking this, and there's the Yule Boar. What is the Yule Boar? That is another interesting thing that's just popped up there. We'll read that in a minute. The Yule Boar. Because I love boars, don't you? They're wonderful creatures. So we'll we'll have a look at that in a minute. Um American folklorist. That's a great word, folklorist. 
Linda Watts provides the following over, overview of the custom. The familiar custom of burning the Yule log dates back to earlier solstice celebrations and the, tradi the tradition of bonfires. The Christmas practice calls for burning a portion of the log each evening until the twelfth night. All right, okay. Let's just put some of this bit, this bit in here. Burning a portion of the log each evening. I don't know whether that's going to play any role in how this how this evolves um, until the twelfth night. So they're t they're tying it in with some kind of religious connotation here. The the log is subsequently placed beneath the bed for luck, and particularly for protection from the household threats of lightning and, with some irony, fire. Many have beliefs based on the Yule log as it burns, and by counting the sparks and such, they seek to discern their fortunes for the new year and beyond. So, discerning their fortunes is an interesting one. I don't know how that would tie in, but that there certainly sounds interesting. New year and beyond. Um... Watts notes that the Yule Log is one of various emblems of divine light that feature in winter holiday customs. Other examples include the Yule Fire and the Yule Candle. Mm. It is medieval. Vikings would attack the English periodically. Maybe they would during Christmas time as well. Mm. If it's medieval, if it's medieval, Vikings would attack the English Periodically, yeah. Yeah. That's kind of pre... It's earlier. That's that's sort of earlier than the medieval period, isn't it? Yeah, it's more like the... Yeah. It's difficult to exactly know where these dates start, isn't it? But... It seems to, it seems to be a thing of luck and fortune. So maybe we'll we'll have a think about that, whether that plays into it. According to the Dictionary of English Folklore, although the concept of Yule extends far into the ancient Germanic record, long before Christianization, the first clear references to the tradition appear in the 17th century, and thus it is unclear from where or when exactly the custom extends. However, it has long been observed that the custom may have much earlier origins, extending from customs observed from Germanic pagan, yes. Um... As early as 1725, Henry Bourne sought an origin for the Yule Log in the Anglo-Saxon paganism. Our forefathers, when the common devices of Eve were over, the night would was come on, were wont to light up candles an uncommon size, which would call which were called Christmas candles, and to lay a log of wood upon the fire, which they termed a Yule clog or Christmas block. These were illuminating the house and turn the night into day, which custom in, is, in some measure is still kept up in northern parts. Turn the night into day. Hmm, interesting. Turn the night into day. A kind of, it's almost like a metaphor, isn't it? Um... These uh, were to illumine the house and turn uh, the cuss of northern part. It, it, it hath, in all probability, been derived from the Saxons, for Bede taught, tells us that the very night was obser observed in the land before by the heathen Saxons. They began, says he, that year on the 8th of the calendar of January, which is now our Christmas party, and the very night before, which is now holy to us. Ceremonies which were performed that night ceremonies, it seems to have been used as an emblem of the return of the sun and the length of the day. Okay, so it's a metaphor for the sun. For the sun. Okay, night into day. The log is the sun and the hope. Okay, interesting. 
Hmm. Um, they began. Uh, I've lost my plots, but it seems that he used the emblem of return the sun. For us both, December and January were called um, Julie or Yule upon account of the sun's returning and the increase of the days. So I'm apt to believe the log has had the name of the Yule log from its being burnt as an emblem of the returning sun and the increase of its light and heat. This was probably the reason of the custom among heathen Saxons, but I cannot think the observation of it is continued in the same reason after Christianity was embraced. So yeah, you can see why that would be the case, because I guess a log or an object wouldn't be seen to have divine power to bring light and only uh, a, a god figure uh, a jesus figure would be able to have that presence or power um another one here uh communal bonbons uh more recently j g r wiley for a, in 1983 um says uh, communal bonbons were festing with with feasting and jollification have a pagan root ritual bonfires at the beginning of november once signaled the start of yet uh, start of an, another year and the onset of winter their subsequent incorporation into the christian calendar to become part of the parcel of the festival of christmas and later their association with the new year january 1st is an intriguing story many if not all of the various customs and traditions at one time extensively witnessed at christmas and the old new year stem from the common source of twelfth night bonfires including old meg from worcestershire and burning the bush from herefordshire first footing etc any traces of, of primitive rituals such as scattering of burnt ashes or em embers as an omen of fertilization or purification have long since disappeared okay so ashes and um fertilization which ties in with the growing the trees and the fertilization and you know if you burn the yule log what's left over the ash can you be used to enrich in the soil so there's an interesting kind of circle if you like The events of Yule were generally held to have centred on midwinter, although specific dating is a matter of date debate. And feasting, drinking, sacrifice uh, were involved. Coins at pagan Yule fest had a pronounced religious character, and that it is uncertain whether the German Yule feast still had function in the cult of the dead and in the venification of the ancestors, a function which the midwinter sacrifice certainly held for the Western European Stone and Bronze Ages. Yule customs and traditions of the Yule log, Yule goat and Yule boar are still reflected in the Christmas ham, Yule singing and others which Simek takes as indicating the significance of the feast in the pre-Christian times. Okay, so what we've got basically is the Yule log kind of symbolizes new beginning, uh, it's light and then it's burning, then transfers into kind of like a, a fertility, uh, fertilization of the land. Fascinating. So it's kind of almost, it's, 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 there's like a, a ceremony whereby by burning it, you are bringing hope. Interesting. And that ties in with um, looking after trees, this, this idea, this concept of tree fertilization. Okay. All right. Um, diffusion and modern practices. Mm. Um, the first mention of the log burned around Christmas comes from Robert Herrick's 
Poetry Collection, 1648, where it's called the Christmas Log. The Yule Log is recorded in the folklore archives of much, much of England, particularly in collections covering the West Country and the North Country. For example, in this, in his section regarding Christmas observances, J.B. Partridge recorded then, current 1914, Christmas customs in Yorkshire, Britain, involving the Yule Log, as related by Mrs. Day, um, Minchinhampton, Gloucestershire, a native of Swadle, Swadledale. The Yule Log, the custom is as follows. Medieval Christmas was celebrated. Maybe that could be how many turns or rounds. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Twelve days. Potentially. Potentially. I'm still thinking um, seasonally. We could be looking at the four seasons as uh, a way of doing it. Hmm. We'll play, uh, what I'll do is I'll, I will draw some maps. And we'll see whether that kind of ties in nicely. Um, at this point, uh, the Yule Log is generally given and is at once put on the hearth. It is unlucky to have a light. Is It is unlucky to have to light it again after it is once started. And it ought not to go out until it is burned away. Sit around the Yule Log and tell ghost stories is a great thing to do this, this night. Also, card playing. Two large coloured candles are a Christmas present from the grocery. Just before supper on Christmas Eve, um, where fumity, firm, firmity is eaten, while the Yule Log is burning, all other lights are put out and the candles are lit. All right. Okay. We're not getting further with that. We kind of see what that what that's all about. <coughs> Excuse me. We're going to have a quick look at the Yule Boar, just see if that offers anything. Now, um, now I'm never going to say this word correctly. Sonar, sonar, gul, gul, gul tree, sonar gul tree. Apparently, Christmas trees weren't started until 1600s, which for most of the internet seems to be the official medieval exactly. <coughs> so you could say 1600. It could be a fantasy medieval world, for all we know, that has pulled in some of our traditions. I don't mind doing that sort of thing, having a, like a another reality, another virtual world that is similar. Um, Sonar Gul Gultry, Sonar Gultry, the Yule Boar, uh, was the boar sacrifice as part of the celebration of Yule in Germanic paganism on those bristles solemn vows were made a tradition known as height strig strigening height strigening the havara saga refers to the tradition of swearing oaths on the yule eve by laying hands on the bristles of the boar who was then sacrificed in the sonar block blute Bloat. Right, okay. Hmm. Hmm. The choice of the board indicates a connection with Freya, whose mount is a gold bristled boar, Gullenbursti and the continuing Swedish tradition of eating pig shaped cakes at Christmas recalls earlier customs okay all right uh, there's not a lot going on there I mean boars may come into this later on all right um, well uh, I'm feeling kind of involved with this tree element 
thing. So what I, what I think we'll do is we'll have a look at um, fir trees and how those trees are affected by things and potentially what um, what could kill a fir, a fir tree. This is the mechanic. We can put in a story around this. Some people may look at that and think that's a fairly boring thing to do a game about. But if we look at talking about deer and we're talking about hunters and we're talking about maybe potential raiders, um, we can throw in other narrative around it and create that um, create that concept. I, I quite I just I I do like management games. I do like the thought of being able to create a management game and and have it set it off if you like, make a series of decisions and see what those combination of mechanics produce. Once you, once you get, once it starts to grow, if you like. So um, we'll get, and I'll get another bit of paper. Just bear with me a sec. Okay. Do do do. Apparent. Uh, oh yes, sixteen hundreds. Yes, the medieval period. Is a, it's kind of like a kind of. It's a bit of a unknown quantity, isn't it? The Dark Ages or the medieval period, or whatever you want to call it. Medieval period leading into Dark Ages leading to the medieval medieval period. Who knows? Right. Um. So what I'm going to do here, um, green, red, gold, white, and blue are seen as the colors of Christmas. Have you played Cultist Simulator? If you like management games, no. It's a video game, not tabletop. Cultist Sim, no, I haven't. Have you, re have you played Medieval Dynasty? Now that's a great game. That, I love that game. All right, so um, let's have a quick look here. Uh, fir tree, so what we need to do is growing, growing fir trees. All right. So, um, actually, let's put down here. What type of soil do fir trees like? So, we're going to have a look at elements. Fir trees. Can you see that? No. We'll bring that down. type of soil so type of soil they like moist but well drained slightly acidic soil all right so that's fascinating we've already got a number of interesting uh, uh, elements there so um, soil and it's got in brackets clay sand or loam acid or natural pH neutral sorry neutral pH yeah yeah pH level 
um, and we'll leave a space and we'll put conditions here so they're pretty they're pretty hardy they're pretty hardy plants um, full Sun any aspect in a sheltered condition we're gonna have to look into that a bit more so um, touch all they like moist acid okay so it could be that it, it's a video game oh yes so I read that one all right so um, how to grow successful uh, gardening let's go with this one gardening 101 just loading So we've got here moist but well drained. That's important. Slightly acidic. Slightly acidic soil. Mm. Clay sand or loam. This is not okay. Hello. How to plant fir trees. Okay, a shallow network of of, lead, of roots. They have. So they're, they're maybe susceptible to being knocked. It might be that we we have, we introduce things like maybe trolls. Maybe we're, we're looking at, at throwing in some, some monsters here, potentially. But then would they have the same sort of religious or desire to have fir trees in their homes? That is a, a, a crossover. protection from so need protection from high winds So we need, okay, all right. All right, what else can we find out here? Building up assets, if you like. Ash is good for fir trees. The Yule log after burned was traditionally used to fertilize plants. Yes, yeah, yeah, so there's that connection. So we've got the Yule, the Yule, We need to think of uh, maybe maybe we'll try tying some kind of creature into this. Okay. Qualities of a good a good location for fir trees. All right. So we need we're looking at assets. These are assets, aren't they? That we need to consider for the game mechanics.
Right, we've got. Uh, make sure you have the right variety in the right location. Don't plant where they subject to strong winds. They will burn and go brown. Okay. Strong winds cause the tree to burn and go brown. All right. But it's only during Christmas, not during the season to not during the seasons to grow the trees. Okay. Yes. Yeah. The resulting however the ultimate aim is to create to grow the Yule log. So it isn't the aim isn't to grow Christmas trees to put in a house. The aim is to get the perfect tree to to grow the Yule log. You've been tasked with this job to produce the Yule log for the new year and it has to be a spectacular quality. All right. Um, don't plant where they're subject to strong cold winds as they will burn and go brown. That is strong cold winds. Most conifers like acid soils, so incorporate some ericaceous compost into the planting hole. So high um, acid soil. So um, they like ericaceous compost. All right, so that's interesting. We can remember we were talking about the grids and the let and the land and the bands of different types of soil. We'll have a look at that. That that would be like a bonus. Maybe we roll for each tree as we go through each season. You, you can act in those. Maybe it's just four turns. You can act in that season and you can do a number of things. And at the end of the season, you roll for that tree and that tree would have been buffed or it'll have a certain... There'll be some... some how can I say? Uh, improved conditions or that, that, that make that tree grow well. It may only grow a certain amount. So there's one roll. You're creating like a, a formula. Yeah, it's like a you're creating like a formula for success. It's not meant to be a game that lasts forever or anything, like for ages. And the variety, do you remember I was talking about the variety of sheets? You could have, as I say, different land plots where you try and grow these trees. That could be that could be key to it. Ericaceous compost, right. Most conifers, uh, dig a hole to come out the yep, tease out the yep, plant. Don't really wanna. Don't really want containers, problems. Okay, so we've got some problems here. So, um, problems. Just um, put those like that. Um, problems. Conifers most commonly suffer from brown patches, which can be caused by a number of factors. Aphids. Um, fungal diseases. Doesn't actually say which type here, which is annoying. Well, they might not necessarily need to know the type. Most common cause is adverse growing conditions. Yes, yeah, so we, that's going to be a key factor. This can be that the soil is too waterlogged. Okay, so too waterlogged. Or too dry. Okay. A prolonged period of frost or a cold north... Or, ah, prolonged frost. Not much you can do about that. Or cold north winds. 
north or east winds. Okay. Often the first sign of an aphid attack is the presence of sooty mould. Okay, sooty mould. This would be good. So you may have to either spray the mould with fungal side or soapy water before spraying the insects with insecticide, as the coal as this could prevent the treatment from penetrating the plant. Only spray with an, an insecticide if you actually see the insects as something as sometimes by the time their presence is evident they have moved on. Right. Maybe you could roll and fill in a tab with a number, add fertilizer and other elements to increase the roll. Where you're growing them will affect the roll. In the end you'll add up the total. Yes, that's basically what I was saying. I mean it's the the formula for success, which is written down here. It's a combination of factors. And throw on top of that things like deer or if we're gonna make it fantasy, it could be roaming trolls and um uh local poachers poachers and trolls maybe maybe we'll do that poachers and trolls seems like a like we could bring some sort of fantasy fun elements into it um Okay, we've got another one here. Let's have a look at this. Um, so we need some way of getting rid of aphids without using kind of modern insecticides. So it could be that you create a soapy liquid, as it was suggesting, that helps clean clean them off. Uh, if the tree dies completely, honey fungus or pyro... Phthoria could be the culprit, in which case the tree needs to be removed and destroyed. Okay. Honey fungus. Excellent. That sounds like um, deadly. It needs to be removed. Or it infects the tree next door. Don't cut back um, into old wood as conifers don't regenerate. Okay. Conifers don't regenerate. I don't know if that might not necessarily be of any importance for this game, but we'll write it down anyway. <coughs> Excuse me. Right, sorry about that. <clears throat> if brown patch is extensive, it can take many years, if at all, to regenerate. So removing the tree could be the best option. If there is just a small patch, you may be able to... Okay. Good. We're getting some key elements here. <clears throat> I'll be back in just one sec. <clears throat> All right. Okay, so we just pick getting the assets here, the stats, so we can convert that into the the mechanics of the game. Um, there was a section that said about the types of soil, acid soil. Let me just go back to that sec. Oh, that's the wrong one. How to grow conifers. Uh, did it say a, a pH level? 
for soil. Did I write that down? No. Okay. Um, so, it's important to note that obviously pine trees are quick to grow. Also, maybe like in Rad Zone, you could colour a region of the ground a certain colour to determine the best soil. Yeah, well, that's the plan. Look, that's what I was talking about earlier on. So we've got this, this map where we've got these curved areas here, and those are the different types of soil, and they'll be different colours or textures one of those one of those two so or maybe both so they have a large central root as well uh, most as for the roots most pines uh, will have a large central tap root surrounded by a shallow regular root system this is good to keep in mind when picking a pot Oh yes. Let's have a look. Mo like most plants, the pines simply require light, water, carbon dioxide, and nutrients in order to survive. In addition to this, they have other preferences such as well-drained, slightly acidic soils. We talked about that, haven't we? So, um, the well-drained soil do you prefer when you loose soils when looking for soil type purchase? You want to think of something more sand, large articulates, uh, organic and organic matter. Going along with this, pines can also handle a little more dry soil as they are used to being well drained. Additionally, pines can manage most natural soil types. However, they do tend to thrive in soils that are low, more acidic in pH, uh, in pH. So a low pH level. This can be accomplished by finding acidic soil amendments or by letting needles drop and self mulch their own tree. Okay. So the leaves themselves, the needles that drop, are of a low um, pH level. As for pots, um, many people claim that terracotta is the best. Uh, what ground conditions do pine trees hate? Good question. Um, now that we know things that pines like and thrive on, it's important to know what they do not like so you can avoid it. To begin with, pines suffer, prefer lots of sun, so shady conditions can stress them out. If you're growing in a pot and your tree is relatively small and medium sized, it can show fairly easy. Too little light can cause things such as drooping yellow needles or even needles falling off as a whole. Okay. Two little light um, droopy yellow needles most pines do not like being in very wet soggy conditions for a long period of time this can be a problem in many pots which can often have problems with holding on to too much water for too long. Best soils amendments for pines. Okay, so so we're get, we're getting there. We're getting the the assets of this. <clears throat> to preface this, it's quite common and sometimes even recommended not to use traditional soil. 
as can be seen, soilless mixes for pine trees in containers. Bark, mosses or sands. Most of the components of soilless mixes are very large in size and put together they create large air pockets the roots can grab onto. This is very important with things like pines that need organic matter for their root to, to hang off of. Okay, so organic matter is good. It's good. All right. It's like a few adverty things here. So um, another soil you can use is an, uh, in most cases you can simply use pre-made acid lovers mixed on its own. However, you can also add other things to it if you want, such as compost or mulch. Okay, can add compost or mulch. Pine trees derive in acidic to mildly acidic soil. The pH of 5.5. Um, hey Nick, how are you doing? We're doing a little bit of um, game design here. I'm just fleshing it out. We've, we were looking at a festive and we came upon this story of the legend of Thunder Oak. And he talked about fir trees. And I suddenly thought, well, how would, how, what a game would be like if you had to manage fir trees over four seasons to get them to a point where you cut them down. And then I read about the Yule Log and how you need a good example of a good of log that would burn potentially for 12 days and 12 nights. That does tie in a religious aspect to it, but we, we won't include that necessarily. So the Yule Log brings... Um, uh, it symbolises the turning of night into day and the embers from the Yule log can be used in crops or growing other trees. So there's a kind of like a, a natural circle. And so what I'm doing now is... And we'll throw that into like a medieval fantasy world and, and there might be other things that cause trouble. So you'd have a little map and you have some trees and you may have some... And you encounter a series of problems through each season. Each season may have, say two events that you have to deal with it may be that the maps in the middle and you have the events tables around the, on the page and i want it to be one sort of single page okay and so we're just getting some assets and some elements that we could use as mechanisms um in order to maintain the health of a pine tree it's important to make sure that it always has ample access to nutrients you can do this by adding such things as compost acid fertilizer um, which uh, both love like pine trees. So I'm becoming a pine tree expert. In the event that your pine tree is evaporating water too quickly with the soil, this mixes, you can also add mulch. So problems here. Soil is too compact and tight. So that could be a problem. So we'll have to have a look at how that works. And um, um, yellowing, slow growth, slow growth, compact soils. So it looks like potentially the worst there are so we'll, we'll i'll do another page with with key problems um so we'll 
type water pH level is going to be right. Okay, I think we're almost there to sort of lay down some pros and cons here. Let's have a look. So, um, how the tree is affected. Let's put how the tree is affected. All right, we've got the um, pros and we've got um, cons. And these will become assets or um, elements that you have to avoid or you have to adhere to. So they like well drained soil. Clay. Hmm. You'd think clay wouldn't be. We'll use clay. We'll put sand and loam. Sand, loam, and a good organic mix. A good mix. We'll just put there. Um. So it doesn't like um where do we put down here compact tight soil okay doesn't like that okay um, high uh, acid, acidic, or neutral soil. Okay, probably slightly acidic, slightly acidic. And then we've got a uh, so it's not going to like an alkaline. soil so we, if, if it's alkaline it's not going to be that's a negative thing um, it, it's, it likes full sun likes full sun doesn't like um, constant shade Um, it's got um, shallow roots and it's got but it's got a central um, tap root all right um so organic matter is good. Um, it likes organic matter, but um, so um, dry, dead soils is bad. Dry, dead soil, and. Um, strong winds cause a tree to burn. Strong cold winds doesn't like strong like shelter. Strong cold winds. My cat is asking to go out, but I open the door and he doesn't go. Go on then. Yeah, it's bloody cold out there. 
We've had an in we had an inch of snow overnight. Um, right, quite like shelter. Um, strong cold winds doesn't like. It's not like one of these. You don't see very often a pine tree or a uh, fir tree necessarily on its own in in nature. Do you see it in field in groups? You see more deciduous trees uh, on their own, and they kind of have a, a different sort of structure, don't they? They kind of have a spread structure, so they can deal with the the force of the wind. Whereas these tend to bend more, I guess, and if they're shallow roots. Are moving as they do that, then that can't be good for the tree. Exposed areas, just put exposed. But they do like full sun. Um, right, so we do have a couple other things down here. We've got diseases, so we've got aphids. Aphids equals a sooty mold and honey fungus, which sounds great. Sounds disgusting. There I am. Um, firs, pines group up in open fields. They aren't really anything to give them shade. Yeah, I guess they shade each other, don't they? If they're in groups, that's how I kind of view it. Honey fungus. But would you see one on its own? I don't think I, I've really, really recall seeing one fir tree on its own. Scots pines, maybe they're kind of they're tall. They have very few branches, and they just have that bit at the top, and they're kind of all twisted. All right. Okay, looks pretty good. So we've got the honey fungus and the aphids, which are good um, things to sort of look out for and throw at the players, at the solo player. Um, what kills fir trees? Um, Five common fir tree diseases to look out for. Swiss needle cast. Begun to spread more and more in specific. Okay. White pine blister rust. Another fungal disease. White pine blister rust has been found in 38 states. Oh, God. Okay, we could put this down as um, affects saplings. Swollen branches. White pine blister. Rust. Swollen branches. Um, top kill. These can be spread, can spread very slowly. All right, so that, that's that's quite good. That's quite deadly if you get it in the young. Parasitic beasties would be an issue. Yes, that is a good, a good point. Parasitic. We've got insect infestations. We've already looked at aphids. This is about a problem that can cause uh, or ex exasperate, be exasperated by illnesses. You must learn to recognize the signs and symptoms of infested tree. Um, common enemies in the fir trees in the United States include bark beetles, which are known 
to griddle even healthy trees, uh, to girdle even healthy trees as they lay their eggs. Douglas fir beetles tend to seek out trees that have already been weakened by other diseases. However, if there are no weakened trees available, these beetles will seek out a healthy tree. Termites are another common pest species. You can recognise the signs of termite infestation. Sawdust tracks. Mm. Termites. Oh, this, this sounds pretty uh, grisly. Termites. And uh, what was the other one? Bark beetle. I think that's probably a type. Bark beetles. All right, there's a few. There's a few there that we can use. Dwarf mistletoe. Sudden oak death. That that sounds like oak disease. Certainly, uh, the the entry on this list with the most common alarming name, sudden oak death, is caused by fungal infection. This uh, pathogen infects a tree through the soil, causing a blight that can kill off leaves and twigs of the fir tree. The name sudden death oak is cert certainly fitting when it comes to oak trees. Unfortunately. Fortunately, if you have fir trees, the lethal action of the pathogen acts much slowly, much more slowly, allowing you to work to solve the issue. Sudden death. Okay. All right. We've got termites and bark beetles. The termites leave. Um, how do we see here? Termites leave. Termites can association then. Sawdust tracks. Okay, and bark beetles. All right, we'll we'll leave that like that for the minute. Douglas fair beetles in bark beetles to watch uh, girdle even healthy trees right okay the pros well drained soil sand loam good mix what's um Poorly drained soil types. Let's just check this. Poor drain soils, uh, just having a little bit related terms. Um, we probably went Nightberg. Ah, I loved your rad zone, Nick says. Uh, ground color idea, have seen that in some farming sims before. Nice, nice, stressed, poor. Okay. Oh. Right, we are, this is not the easy thing to find out. Uh, come on in. That's my cat being annoying, okay? Pan. 
compacted ground. So depending on how compact the ground is, I think is going to have a massive play on this. I just thought maybe colouring the ground because why else would you attempt to grow trees on bad soils to begin with? Oh. Oh yes. Yeah, well that was yeah, that's something we were gonna do anyway. That's um we kind of talked about that earlier on. Yeah, we have a you can see this little drawing here. This is this well, the, the way that I look at it is if you get hold of a, a a piece of land and there are some trees on it, right, you've got to nurture those trees too. You're not planting these trees, you're inheriting that piece of land. Right, okay, well, let's, let's move on to, um, we've got the pros and cons. We're going to go with some sort of generic terms to begin with. So we've got a sheet. So my plan is to, um, we want to be able to have, we have the kind of, this is how I'm kind of envisioning it, envisioning this, right? So we have a map in the middle. Let me just try and get the same distance here, like so. All right. So this is going to be your arena. So we may, it doesn't really have to have any grids on it, I don't feel at the moment. So as we talked about before, it may be that we have some kind of and each of these areas, so we've got, you, you inherit some trees, and they are, you've got to try and grow these trees. And maybe there's some, maybe there's some grown in this area. Now these zones, looking at it, I reckon, Just like your, your local landowner said, like we need a yule log. And we'll just give it a rough name to begin with. Um, something like yule log manager. <laughs> yule log. Um, so these zones have sp specific quality. Quali qualities and um, so we'll we can kind of randomize it and say um, we might have some kind of reference so you the details are actually on the map next to it so um, it may be this soil condition is we have some details here so it would be um sand sandy um exposed maybe we have a, like a little Sandy, exposed, and then, okay, so we, we need like, we need the soil, we need the location, so we need like a, we need like a stat box, don't we? Be like three words, the, the soil, 
soil outlook and um, uh, pH. Remember, these like five point Um, they're at 5.5 so the sandy exposed and then we might say four so you could almost you could almost say that you've had this this piece of land and that the, your land this this landowner said to you there are some fir trees going there can you see if you can bring those grow those up to be um so we can have a Yule log for the new year. So each one's got a slight block of stats. So we could go on this one. And we'll need a, a, a range, won't we? Maybe it's actually attached to it. Um, it means we won't have to use any arrows. So, um, loam um, exposed. And this is exposed because of maybe other stuff around it. And we'll have maybe five. And then just connect that up there. Sandy, um, exposed, and four. <clears throat> and then um, over here, we've got two more, haven't we? They're connected. They each have their own box. Sheltered. Can't really, yeah. Maybe I should just put shelter in a shorter word. Not much shorter, though. Ah, <laughs> got to put the soil type first. So, um, we'll go this top one compact and then shelter. And maybe a three. Hang on a minute. I'm just streaming at the moment, so. Oh. Ivy, pull that door too, will you? Yeah. No. Okay, um, and then, sorry about that, kids are arriving home. All right, so, um, we then have um, a, uh, uh, maybe loose, and we'll put shelter, maybe we've got some kind of ridge that comes up here. Maybe we'll put dots in that indicate land features. Maybe that might be a way of doing it. And then we have um, shelter. 
so kind of some kind of ridge there that drops down this is these are higher this is like a higher ridge maybe there's arrows indicating the land movement and then um, we'll go with three on this one so we've got like a we've got like a little environment whereby um, when these are attached to this area you know maybe in fact we could just take these circles out we need like four zones don't we we need four zones like so okay and there may be the tree here all right okay and um, just pull that too all right so interestingly we've got like a little kind of like grid type area but we also need to have assets for these trees so if we've got um, so if we look at the tree we need to think of some sort of design that is going to fit around the tree so if we've got the tree like this I'm going to make it slightly bigger maybe I shouldn't maybe what we need as I, as I suggested before Maybe there's five growth stages. And each tree has like a, a, a thing. This is, this is the growth of the tree. And then we've got at the top, maybe we'll have above the tree a um, number of indicators. So we've got yeah maybe we have varying degrees of condition in a sense so this is your age although probably should be four because we want because it's four seasons as far as i can tell so far cross that out so maybe it's four Maybe they've got to get through four periods of time. Yeah, I think it's going to be fours. Okay. So we've got. So it has to go through four. And then we've got looking looking at this dial. It's fascinating actually, because we we've got to think about we've got if a tree is has some sort of infection yeah so we could reduce it down to make it f so we could just look at honey fungus and aphids as the two main things say for example or we could have three we could have aphids so aphids could be um like a green so we can color code this green the this could be three dots that you kind of green yellow red yeah well, that's that's what i said before wasn't it <laughs> um we're using the same system as as rad zone um but i'm thinking we want to theme these colors so we've got green for aphids because aphids are green. We've got the honey fungus, which is um, a yellow. We can uh, that would be the yellow, and then I think um, we won't use the red because that that is like that, that's a big indicator. Um, 
maybe we'll use bark beetles. Or, yeah, we'll do bark beetles as black. So you just color it in black, that dot. And if we had dots, Um, up here and then we had like another thing here all right so in so these dots we color red if you get three dots of red your tree is dead okay three reds is dead All right, that is your indicator at the top there. Three lives, each tree gets three lives. These are your seasons. Maybe we could use, <coughs> we could use other colors as well actually. You may have to use a, a range of colors. So we've got black as the bark beetles. All right, yellow, And so you would color these, this is the conditions. This is the age. All right. So you would basically, each season you'd fill one of these in. But during that season, if they got a condition, which is associated with that season, you would color it in the color that was indicated. All right. So, So that is the age, that's the season if you like. But if, um, so basically I'm thinking, we want to be able to take action. We need, the player needs to um, have agency. Otherwise they won't feel like they're playing the game. So we're gonna do another one of these. So we've got the tree, I'm gonna do it bigger so we can, Clearly see got the tree. All right, we've got the seasons from the tree. Okay. And we've got another thing below it. So obviously we're gonna to have to fit that onto this this map. And it may be that this needs to be bigger. Alright. So we've got that. Then we've got the three lives, the three dots at the top. We colour those, they don't have to be coloured in red. They can just be coloured in. If you colour those in three three it doesn't have to be big, it just be you can just colour that in black with your pen. These represent the seasons but I think also next to it, what we need is a, uh, a space for an action. So you can say spend some money, spend some resources on, and you'll need a like a column on this thing where you put your, your gold. Okay. So we then need a um, something in like a barrier. So maybe next to it, there are there is there are some boxes like this, like that. It's starting to look quite abstract. So um, I mean, you could arguably write in. A plus or minus based on maybe spending some money and because we know what that tree is so say we spent some time say this the soil is say the soil is tight 
is compact. Okay, we could, if you were then um, thinking, right, I need to loosen up the soil. How could you do that? I guess you could go in and maybe dig into the soil and um, potentially um, you could maybe color one of these in. Yeah. So these little, these are like barriers or bonus areas. Hmm. Stunted growth. How could you show something that isn't growing? All right. So um, in these, maybe you could put an initial. How big is this over here? If we've got something like that sort of size, you can't really do anything with it. You're going to have to. Okay. All right. All right, so um, let's have a think. So we've got, let's have a look at how we, what conditions. So these conditions in here, let's just, let's just have a go at this. We get some colors. Here. So if we had, say, aphids, yeah, so this actually, we could write in this, we could write in this, this is the, the season. So this could be, um, if on the season, you get aphids. Aphids are yellow. It would go in here, and this would be coloured yellow. And then that means that that tree would, um, if you fail, you can start again on a new sheet. Yes. Maybe for simplicity, just focus on growing the one tree instead of a few. That's a good idea. Um, I'll put that down here. Maybe one tree. That's a nice. That's a nice concept. I like that one. Um, we'll we'll plow on with this just for the minute. So that means that this this is he's got uh, aphids in that season. So that's spring. If you like spring summer autumn winter and <clears throat> well I mean I can have a look I can look in more detail when aphids generally appear maybe that they appear in the summer maybe the mold maybe um, the white pine blister rust um, appears in say autumn and you have to check in autumn um, particular, um, particular threats appear at different times of the year, potentially. Each season could have their own table of events effects. Yes, as, as I was just saying. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. It may be that in winter there's the strong cold winds. That seems to be a logical, logical progression. I mean, this in a sense could be this could be the arena, as you're saying, one tree. Arguably, I still like the idea of trying to manage a group of trees, because I feel that will throw up lots of. A wider narrative 
um, and we could have other effects on the field uh, like um, a wind might affect all the low lying so the wind could expect so if we had a wind event so for example like the wind event would affect all those in exposed regions for example I just have a wind event all trees in exposed region affected yeah it might be that um, heavy rains heavy rains um, all trees in um, sheltered areas become bogged or something like that water flooding over fields yes field flooding that's another good one field flooding that would seem to make sense and they don't like to be in a constant wet area because they like a free draining soil so because this looks like a horizon this line here these this line in a sense it's kind of it could represent a horizon line this could be where we um, shore up areas and it may be more of a it may be that you don't actually mark that up maybe you could draw it on here certain assets Yeah, each area, each of these areas has a box attached to it. I'm quite happy to have boxes coming out at angles. So this area, so when you spend some money, this area here that this is attached to, you could say, um, for the exposed, right? you could have um, plant more trees plant more um, vegetation to shelter area that might be an action so this might be an action box actions so each one of these has a kind of like their own action box like that and we design it so that they would fit in neatly and um, it could be um, to increase the acidic levels you add in um, natural fertilizers say I think that so that you up the acidic level in that area maybe that you build fences you build fences to keep the deer out um, that might be a good a good technique potentially Let me just on here. So we want to. I quite I quite like the look of that symmetry as well. The way that that sits. So if you've got an aphids, you might put like a minus one, depending on. You'd have to assign everything. Each season is zero until you do something. So it may be that you plus two for building some fences to that tree and you roll each season depending on 
you know how wh what situation the tree is facing trees may at the end uh, may have to have a shock roll if they've got a disease if they've got some kind of parasite or disease that shock roll um uh, if the tree has a disease or damage, uh, make a shock roll. I mean, this these aphids may have uh, when you get an aphid infection. How bad? Um, how bad is it? So how bad is the condition? And what about prevention? What prevention did we did we put in? It's nice for prevention. So maybe on the map, maybe on here, there's like a a seasonal because you know something about it so you break it into here seasonal challenges all right so it may be um obviously we'll we'll need um spring um, summer, autumn, winter. So maybe strong cold winds, flooding, um, aphids, uh, aphids in spring, say, just to spread it out, honey fungus. Excessive heat, drought, thank you. Um, drought. Yes, we have, it's autumn, it's the fall. So we're lucky in this sense, I don't know, I can't remember where about you live, but here in the UK, we have three months of spring, summer, three months of autumn, three months of winter. It's all spaced out pretty perfectly. There is a, there is, sometimes the summer might slightly extend maybe, or winter may slightly extend into spring, but that is generally how we see it. And that's kind of how I'm gonna do it, kind of. Um, so we've got drought, like that. Um, honey fungus, and we'll have termites in, although we don't get termites in the UK. I'm gonna throw it anyway, because obviously um, this is, we want it to be cross-cultural. Um, Strong cold winds. Um, what else could we have on this one? What else have we got? Shadow roots, stride, um, roaming trolls. Um, spring, summer, we may have. Um, maybe we'll have the um, white. Yeah, we'll, we could take the um, the trolls out if we want to. Yeah, same. Autumn is considered summer for us. Spring, uh, September, October, November are considered fall. Right. In Nebraska, it is either fall or autumn, depending on who you are, you, who you talk to, lol. <laughs> so, um, spring, what else could we have in spring? What else do we have? Full sun, compact tight storm, alkaline soil, constant shade. Um, maybe spring. Mm. Lots of rain in spring. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, spring shower, autumn showers, spring showers, um, flooding. We'll put it in there to begin with. Put it in there like that. You could get flooding in winter as well, but you know, put it there. Um, drought, strong cold winds, exposed. Uh, we've got the aphids, we've got the honey fungus, we've got the white. Oh, yes. We'll put um, white pine blister rust um, bark beetles in autumn, in spring. And we'll leave summer with just two. Although actually, we were going to have, no, we'll have summer, we'll have poachers. They go in there for the animals during the summer, but they also damage the trees while they're at it. Okay. All right. We're looking good. Okay. Deer can cause damage from rubbing antlers on branches in fall. Yes. We've got the deer in in the fall here. So, yes, I completely agree. All right, seasonal challenges. There we go, three in each. Aphids, flooding, beetle, bark beetles, drought, termites, poachers, flooding, honey fungus, white deer, um, strong cold winds, roaming trolls, white pine blister rust. Nice, good. All right. So I think what we'll do is that we've had a good good old stream. So uh, I feel like that's a good point to sort of leave it. I'll mull over it a little bit. And then um, we'll either we'll do a session tomorrow or the next day. And um, I'll come we'll come back in with some other bits and pieces. Uh, maybe uh, draw in some other influences. I don't know, but we'll probably we'll develop this further and um, sort of do some maths, if you like, and see see where that goes. <laughs> Thank you both, Nix and Cody, for being here. Appreciate that a lot. Um, we will carry on with this soon, very soon, guys. Thanks for being here. I will catch up with you very soon. <laughs> Develop it further. Very good. <laughs> nice little pun to end on. Good stuff. All right. Here we are. All right, guys. I'll catch up with you soon. All right. <laughs>